This is a Curtis JN4 or Jenny, one of the earliest examples of an aeroplane that was mass produced and this isn't. This is the turbine toucan and I use the definite article deliberately. This is the only aircraft of its type in the world. Now these two aircraft may look alike but looks can deceive. The Jenny was the aircraft that first brought aviation to the general public. After the First World War, thousands of surplus aircraft were bought up for private use and in the absence of regulation, many of these were campaigned across the United States throughout the 1920s by itinerant hobo aviators selling rides and flying ever more reckless stunts to attract the public dollar. Of course, these men also patched up their own machines when they broke them or wore them out. And it took technical savvy as well as flying skills to scratch out a living as a barnstormer before the government shut them down for good in the 1930s. But if we could somehow take the toucan back to 1927, even the most grizzled barnstormer, accustomed to rebuilding his Curtis OX5 engine at least a couple of times a month, would find much of it almost beyond comprehension. That engine, of course, is like nothing he could ever have seen. I have a lot to say about that in a little while, but there's a lot more. Let's not forget that the Jenny was introduced less than a decade and a half after the Wright brothers first flew. Well, the Toucan comes after supersonic travel, global air transport and space flight. Construction wise, the Jenny has a wire braced wooden frame covered with doped fabric and there are some echoes of this in the Toucan, which also has fabric covered wire braced wings, largely made of wood. Apart from that, and the general biplane tailwheel configuration, that's pretty much where the similarities end. Construction wise, the Toucan's frame is tubular steel, fuselage is aluminium, that long engine cowling is carbon fibre, props made of Kevlar, and the wheel fairings fiberglass. But it's probably inside the cockpit where the biggest differences are apparent. Uh, there's many more gauges than in the Jenny course, but those glass instruments are like nothing a 1920s aviator could even imagine. The displays themselves, for example, are a product of several successive technological revolutions, electronics, semiconductors, liquid crystal displays and so on. Of course, what's displayed on them, even more so, the GPS for example, requires space flight, satellite technology, digital computers. Although that biplane layout is something of a concession to nostalgia, it is interesting to note that the basic aircraft form hasn't really changed much since the Jenny's time. Uh, the Toucan uses exactly the same control system as the Jenny, of course, that's ailerons, rudder and elevators controlled by a stick and pedals. So what's this aircraft like to fly? Well, very difficult, in fact. Now, a lot of this is down to the turboprop engine, which FSX doesn't model well at all, but the difficulties are compounded by the Toucan's outrageous thrust-to-weight ratio. Now, in the real world, this airframe is stressed for plus 6 and minus 4 Gs, which should give you a sense of the hammering it's expected to take. Now, that's plus 6, minus 4 routine G loading. It can actually withstand plus 9 or minus 7.5 Gs, which is very likely more than the pilot. It has a thrust to weight ratio of 1.65 to 1, which is the highest thrust to weight ratio of any aircraft in the world, far in excess of most jet fighters. It's the only prop driven aircraft in the world that can climb vertically, and in fact the Toucan can actually accelerate vertically. It's also the only fixed wing general aviation aircraft that can hover. So what's a turboprop? And how's it different to a conventional piston engine? Well, it's basically a gas turbine engine, a jet in other words, driving a propeller. This one's a variant of the Pratt & Whitney PT-6, which you'll find in many modern aircraft, such as the Beach King Air, the Cessna 208 Caravan, or the de Havilland Twin Otter. The PT-6 is a split shaft or free turbine engine, which means there is no mechanical connection between the power turbine and the propeller. If you think of a jet engine with a windmill stuck in its jet blast and with the windmill driving a propeller through a gearbox, that's pretty much the idea. Now I was going to go through the startup here, but I have to say I found it somewhat problematic and unpredictable. So I'm just going to cover startup briefly here. Now you can go through the startup checklist in the manual, although this appears to be for the real aircraft, so not all the steps make sense, but it's a reasonable guide. I recommend two extra steps. First, before flicking the starter switch or before pressing Control E, if you're going to use auto start, you want to hit F1 and then F2, assuming default key mappings. What this does is it sets the prop slightly into reverse. You're going to see that in a lot more detail later. And the second thing is, toggle the start switch up and leave it there and you'll hear the starter spool up the engine and as soon as you hear the roar of that power turbine cut in you want to pull the condition lever back almost to cut off and those two things are going to maximize your chances of having a successful start now if you're lucky the engine's started 
and if you're very lucky and you did everything I said, you stood on the ground and you haven't backed into anything. So having gone through all that rigmarole, I now suggest you forget about cold and dark startups and uh, for three fairly good reasons. First, I've never succeeded in starting the engine from a saved cold and dark flight. Uh, if it works for you, great, but it doesn't work for me, even with auto start. Second, if you do manage to start the engine, you'll usually get a massive surge, even if you manage to pull the condition lever back in time. If you do the F1, F2 trick first, you'll roll backwards, regardless of the brakes. And if you don't do it, the aircraft will take off and enter a steep climb before you've even looked up from pressing the start switch. This is a well-known issue with the FSX turboprop modelling. Because of the huge thrust-to-weight ratio in this aircraft, it's catastrophic. But the third reason not to bother with the startup is, by and large, the Toucan's engine start is fully automated anyway. So in part two, we're going to go for a ride and see how the Toucan handles. We can expect some differences from flying a piston prop. And to understand the differences, we'll have a closer look at the engine controls and also at the gauges we need to be keeping an eye on.